Okay, so we're back for day five. So day five, and then we have a day six, and then we break into the programming languages side. So hope everyone's good. And in this one, we want to get into a bit more of that that continuous, infinite image that there are thousands of Google images on, um, and I just managed to find this one that, that fit quite nicely. So what this one is, is we're going to talk about plan, code, build, testing, release, deploy, operate, monitor. And uh, yeah, in fact, let me get into that and then we'll, we'll jump back into it as well if we need to. So today we are going to focus on the individual steps from start to finish and the continuous cycle of an application in a DevOps world. Okay, so plan. Well, like like all good, like all good battles, we have to we have to firstly come up with a a plan. What are we trying to achieve? So it all starts with the planning process. This is where the development team gets together and figures out what type of features and bug fixes they're going to roll out in their next sprint. Or from day zero, obviously you have to come up with some sort of this is what we're going to build. This is our MVP. This is an opportunity as a DevOps engineer, DevOps engineer, for you to get involved with that and learn what kinds of things are going to be coming your way that you need to be involved with and also offer feedback into with and also influence their decisions or their path and kind of help them work with the infrastructure that you've built or steer them, steer them towards something that's going to work better for them in case they're not on, the, on that path. I'm not expecting developers to know everything about infrastructure and options as to where they can run their application or that what they're developing for those engineers those those folks are already well into developing code and and writing um applications it's either the operations or the devops team that should be there to offer guidance and expertise and subject matter experts in cloud or kubernetes or containerization or 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 and all the other options that we have and this has been my big thing on that and this is a bit of a side note on this is that i speak to a lot of virtualization admins backup admins infrastructure admins and they don't use kubernetes today or they don't use containerization so they've completely stayed away from it though that's not coming to us and my answer to that is you don't know what you don't know so how can you provide your development team, even if it's not even a development team, how could you provide the best option for your application that might be off the shelf application, or it might be your developers? How can you offer that if you don't know what you don't know? Um, bit of a side side note on that. So where was I? So or steer them towards something that's going to work better for them in in case they're not on that path. And so one key thing to point out here is the developers or software engineering team is your customer as a DevOps engineer. So this is your opportunity to work with your customer before they go down a bad path. Absolutely. We should always be thinking about end users. Who is my end user when I'm communicating with XYZ team? Yes, your colleagues and all of that good stuff, but think of them as you help them, they help you, and when you move forward, it's a good way of collaborating. Okay, so the second thing is code. Now, once that planning session's done, they're going to start writing the code. Imagine this is obviously day day zero. We've made a plan. We're going to make this software. We're going to do it this way. We're going to, we're designing it for X, Y, Z platform. Okay, now we're going to start writing the code. Obviously, this is continuous. So. After day zero, you've decided to write something in Golang or you've decided to write something in Python. You're probably not going to get to this point and then decide to change. You're just going to enhance what you're doing around that code. So, okay, so we're making that plan. We're going to start writing the code. Probably the plan actually is where you define what programming language you're, you're going to use or it's based on the skill set of the development team that you have. You may or may not be involved a whole lot with this one. So think this is the key part. Like, I get so many questions about DevOps in that, do I need to learn to code? And no, you're not a developer. And be clear on that. That doesn't mean you can't go down that route, but
but you're not going to be writing your application. You're there to assist your developers in creating a platform, an infrastructure, an environment for them to easily build their application or deploy their application within the business. You're there to offer ways and means to automate that process, simplify that process, enable testing that we'll get onto as well. So, uh, so you may, you may not be involved a whole lot with this one of the plate with this one involved a whole lot with this one of the places you may get involved with it. So what I mean here, uh, let's say, hang on, let me finish this, is whenever they're writing code, you can help them better understand the infrastructure. So if they know that what services are available and how to talk to best talk with those services, so they're going to do that. And then once they're done, they'll merge that code into the repository. One of the reasons why I picked the next section is learning a programming language. It's not necessarily learning a program, programming language to become a developer. And I'll probably spoil in what I kick things off, the big picture around learning the programming language as a DevOps focused person is I want to be able, if I can help, if I can just be able to read or make sense of an application's code base, I might be able to offer some sort of opinion perspective on how to make that better or encouragement or feedback on how we make that better. So that's where I'm getting at here. You're, you're not going to be the one writing the code unless you're building tools for that automation process, like different CLI tools or, or potentially other, uh, pipeline tools, etc. Okay. So then we get to the build phase. So planned, we've planned something, we've created something an MVP or version one to version two. We're now on the build stage. This is where we'll kick off the first of our automation processes because we're going to take their code and we're going to build it depending on what language they're using. It may be transpiring it or compiling it or might be cre creating a Docker image from that code. Either, either way, we're going to go through that process using our CI CD pipeline. Don't get too hung up on that yet. Yeah, continuous integration, continuous deployment or continuous delivery. Don't worry about that. There's a whole section on that that we're going to walk through as well. But know that CI is is part of CI CD is part of that automated process process to make sure that we get from code base to release that our actual end users or, or customers can actually take advantage of of that tool. OK, then we're on to testing. So we built it. And then we're going to like, we can't just leave that there as a, as a release and let our customers go and build it. Well, you could, you're probably not going to have many customers by the end of it. So once we've built it, we're going to run some tests on it. Now the development team usually writes the test. You may have some input in what tests get written, but we need to run those tests. And the testing is a way for us DevOps engineers to try and minimize introducing problems out into production. It doesn't guarantee that. But we want to get as close to a guarantee as we can that we're not introducing new bugs and to not breaking things that used to work. So what I mean, what we mean by this, if you're developing a Kubernetes application and your customer base have all of that weird and wonderful options when it comes to Kubernetes, your pipeline should include running that application in those, those different um, variants of Kubernetes. So whether that, that might be a bit of AKS, EKS, GKE, I want to test my app. I want to deploy it. I want to make sure it works. I, I want to make sure what does that, what does it test look like? I want to actually put it through its paces, um, etc. Okay. Then we get into the deploy phase. So which is the thing that we do next? Because deployment is like the end game of this whole thing, because deployments are when we put the code out into production and it's not until we do that that our business realizes the value from all the time and effort and hard work that you and the software engineering team have put into the product up to this point. It's obviously how we get, you know, if you don't get to the deploy stage, then your customers never ever use your product. I mean, I've got plenty of GitHub repos that are well and truly hidden from the world that will never ever get to that deploy phase because it, nobody should see that stuff. Um, so then we get into the operation 
or the operate stage. Once it's deployed, we are going to operate it and operate it may involve something like you starting getting calls from your customers that they're all annoyed that the site's running slow or their application is running slow. Right, so you need to figure out why that is and then possibly build auto scaling or know how to handle the increased number of servers available during peak periods and decrease the number of servers during off peak periods. Either way, that's all operational type metrics. Another operational thing that you do is include like a feedback loop from production back to your ops team, letting you know about key events that happened in production, such as deployment, uh, such as a deployment back one step on the deployment thing. This may or may not get automated depending on your environments. The goal is to always automate it whenever possible. There are some environments where you possibly need to do a few steps before you're ready to do that. But ideally, you want to deploy automatically as part of your automation process. But if you're doing that, it might be a good idea to include in your operational steps some type of notification so that your ops team know that a deployment has happened. There's a lot in there. Let me let me try and add some add some hat add some color into that as well. So what especially when you're first deploying version one of your product and whether that's an open source project or a commercial based product commercial you'd hope that you have a, a different way of maybe or a faster way of understanding that I don't want I don't want a customer that's just paid XYZ for my product to then ring me up and say this isn't working very well I want I want to uh, get their feedback before before that stage. But this also enables us to, as as focused on DevOps, it allows us to build those correct pipelines that we have out there. There is absolutely no point, because bearing in mind, pipelines cost money. To build, to spin up an EKS cluster costs money. And if no one's using EKS, then why test it? Now, unless that is a, an opportunity that you're going after as a business, and that 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 becomes way above the station. But that's, they're the things to consider. I would much rather understand about scale and the actual customer base that I have or user base that I have, and then make sure that my pipeline is 100% testing the, the, um, the outcomes of, of the software at that point. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. And then we get on to monitor. So all of the above parts lead to the final step because you need to have monitoring, especially around operational issues. Auto scaling, troubleshooting like you don't know there's a problem. If you don't have monitoring in place, and I, I add I always add monitoring and feedback into this because monitoring is hard. Monitoring is sometimes like let it, like just opening the, the floodgates. So many alerts come through, so much comes through, you basically have so many false positives that you don't know what how and, and what to test. And this is where observability comes in to being able to have a better understanding of that. So you don't know there's a problem if you don't have monitoring in place, but then equally it could be a burden because you could have too much um, noise. Um, so, so some of the things you might build monitoring um, for are like things like memory utilization, CPU utilization, disk space, API endpoints, response time, how quickly that endpoint is responding. And a big part of that as well is logs. Um, and again, at the very end of this, we touch on data visualization, login metrics, observability, but logs give the developers the ability to see what is happening without having access to the production systems. So that's another thing that you should build into your application is a very quick and easy way to get those logs from customer A back into you so that you can then look through them or get your development team to look through them to provide feedback on what is going on why is this happening so that's another another big important aspect of that rinse and repeat once that's in place you go right back to the beginning to the planning stage and go through the whole thing again so what i mean by the planning stage so we've built our product we've or well, we've got an mvp uh, a value a viable product we've released it We've gained all of that feedback, that information. Oh, can you work on EKS? Oh, no, actually, we need to do that. Okay, so now we're going we're gonna to plan to write some new code that is going to enable us to deploy to this new environment, this new setting. And then we're going to um, 
we're gonna, so we're gonna we're gonna plan to do that. We're gonna then build the code. We're then gonna incorporate that into our testing, and we're then gonna release it and then deploy that. And at that point, we're then gonna see how our customers or a spe this specific customer that has that that requirement. We're gonna see how that operation thing goes. We're then gonna get that feedback. Hopefully, some logs understand what that is, and we're just gonna get better and better, and more advanced, and more more um more stuff as we as we go okay this is where i just wanted so you're going to hear me say continuous so many times over the course of the the next however many days we've got this for so many tools help us achieve the above continuous process think about that 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 has to be continuous so where we plan we then code we build we test we release we deploy we operate we monitor and then we're back to the planning phase and sometimes this looks like a two-week cycle sometimes it looks like a month for some it uh, it doesn't have to be that that frequent it could be every year but as long as you're doing that as long as you're making a plan for version one to version two and then you're coding that you're making that happen you're building it you're testing it from a qa point of view you're then releasing it and you're deploying it you're then allowing that to be operated and then monitoring that that's fine as well Okay, so all this code and the ultimate goal of being being completely automated. Now, what you can automate and what you can't, we should always strive to automate everything. Touch that on the in the last video. So cloud infrastructure or any environment is often described as continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment, or CRCD. For short, we'll spend a whole week on that later on, on the in the 90 days with some examples and walkthroughs to grasp the fundamentals. And it's important to note on that. So when we get to that section, yes, we're going to touch on the big picture about what it is and how it works. But what we're also going to do is we're going to get hands on with maybe some more. What's the best way of putting it? Jenkins, which is kind of the de facto tool set around CICD. But equally, we're going to look at Argo CD as well and get hands on and also get up actions. So continuous delivery, continuous delivery equals the plan, the code, the build, the test. Continuous integration. This is effectively effectively the outcome of the continuous delivery phases above plus the outcome of the release phase. This is the case for both failure and success, but this is fed back into the continuous delivery or moved to continuous deployment. So continuous integration becomes the plan, code, build, test, release. So continuous deployment. If you have a successful release from your continuous integration, then move to continuous deployment, which brings in the following phases. CI release is success equals continuous deployment. Deploy, operate, monitor. You can see these continuous notions above as the simple collection of phases of the DevOps lifecycle. This last bit was a bit of a recap for me on day three, but think this makes things clearer for me. And I think that's fair. And there's some other other resources much smarter people than me just to clarify on that as well like we've got these two different shades of blue here or or you can hopefully see that two different shades um here as well and that gives you that okay so with that we're now next gonna be on to day six which wraps up this like let's look at devops as a big picture before we get into the programming language so with that thanks for watching Leave any comments in the in the section below. Um, feedback is key on this. Like, is it worth it? Does it work? Are you getting anything from it? That's the that's the key part for this. Awesome.